Well, when it comes to uh, biblical illiteracy in teens, I really ought to know about that because I didn't crack my Bible open in any meaningful or significant way until I was about 19. But then when I finally did, I discovered that there are all kinds of materials out there. There's a lot of Bible study materials, even for our teens today, and they have uh, apps, things from the smartphone, so it's even easier for them. And so what I want to talk about today is not Bible study or intentional Bible reading. What I want to talk about is the huge gap that there is between complete biblical illiteracy and intentional Bible study that comes later with maturity. So Christians learn theology before we ever read the Bible. And uh, that's kind of a, a natural thing because when we get saved or however it happens, we probably have somebody teach us. So we hear the stories or maybe we, we're working with a youth pastor or a pastor. And hopefully what they give us is sound, but some of it might just be total superstition, right? And so it's not good enough for the teens to not have the Bible. And that's why I want to talk about that today. When I was at a Colorado Christian University, I remember when a professor did us with this ominous quote. The God of the Bible does not exist outside of the Bible. Now, he didn't mean that God doesn't exist except in a story. Because obviously he was a professor working in an evangelical college. But he was trying to shake us up because what he meant was that you can only go so far with natural revelation, looking at the mountains, or speculation about who God is. Eventually, if you really want to know who God is, and in particular, if you want to say that you follow Jesus, you're going to have to go to the Bible to learn what that all means. So I just want to tell you about some things that we've done in youth groups throughout the years to address that big gap, the gap between total biblical illiteracy and intentional Bible reading. And you know, some of this stuff is completely silly, but it's worked for us, so give it a chance. So number one, super Bible battle. Super Bible battle goes like this. Pick like two of the most obnoxious kids in your group, and especially if you think that they've never read the Bible before, they're perfect. You bring them up front and give them each a hard copy of the Bible, and what their job is, is they're going to take the Bible, fling it open, and the first verse that they see, they're going to hurl it at the other person as an accusation. So, for example, you know, they're up in front of the crowd, facing each other, open it up, Jesus wept. And then, the other person gets a chance to defend themselves, so they can fling it open, I thank God every day for you. And then, the group gets to decide who the winner is. So then you step it up a little bit, and you make them find a book of the Bible. I would highly recommend Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You want to freak a kid out, give him a Song of Solomon. Because they don't know, because they haven't read the Bible. So, so when they fling it open, it's a lot of fun. And uh, so, really, it's nonsense, but you're using it to get them some familiarity with the Bible. They're going to have to use the index, and part of how they win is how fast they get there. So they can use their phone, whatever. But if they get there quickly, hurl it with some drama, they can win. Um, and then you can also give them books that don't exist. That's also a funny way to freak them out. And then forms. So I brought a couple things just to show you. You know, if you've never seen the Lego New Testament, we just picked this one up in Fort Collins last week used. And it's so great. You can take a picture of these pages with your phone, put it up on the screen, and all of a sudden the kids are paying attention to the story that you're telling them. Did Jesus book? If you don't know about Did Jesus book? <laughs> Let me lay it down for you. This is 1 Corinthians, which in the Jesus book is number one for the current people. You guys know what happened when plenty of runners run in one race, yeah? Everybody run, but only one guy won the first place medal. So then, go for the win for God. This is Hawaiian Pigeon English. It's not a joke. It's a, it's a Wycliffe translation. And the kids think it's so funny. But you know what? They're paying attention. So all of a sudden, they're reading out of that. And we have a, a guy in our teen group that he just loves the Jesus book. That's all he ever wants to read out of. And everybody's laughing, but they're actively listening because it requires a little bit of translation into what's going on. So there you're reading familiarity. And then uh, number three, I like this one. Don't give the kids the passage that you're going to teach. Make them find it. So when I was in youth group, it was always, all right, everybody sit down and turn to Matthew, whatever. And so, like, I'm just flipping pages because I want to look like I'm going there. And then somebody else that's a homeschooler will find it. And then we're going to so, uh, so 
just a, a couple weeks ago, we, we had a lesson, and I just said, find me a story about a wise and a foolish builder, and then just let them go. And when they find it, have them explain to you how they found it. And this will bring all kinds of things up. One of the cool things about that is that they might find different versions of the same story. They don't know about parallel passages yet. And so you can talk about how stories appear in the same story in different places. Have them read both and see what the differences are. So, uh, and it doesn't matter what they use. You know, everything's fair game. Index, smartphone, whatever. But have them explain how they did it to the group and how they found it. And then you can talk about how they can look things up by topic. Um, a little, going a little deeper here. So I found a website, not much deeper, uh, I found a website and it was World War II Love Letters. And we used this one at our summer camp this year. And so I picked a love letter that was not too salacious and printed it out and then gave it to everybody. And I had them in groups go through and, and figure out what is this letter? Because I didn't tell them anything about it. So they're trying to figure out who wrote the letter. They're looking at the date. You know, why is this guy overseas? What's going on in 1943? And they can look things up on their phone if they want to. And eventually they figure out this is a letter from a guy who's deployed overseas to his girlfriend in Kentucky. And then we go to the letter of Philemon and do the same thing. Read through the letter. Who's the letter to? What's the letter about? Can you figure out a date for it? And, you know, in addition to teaching them about genres, a cool thing about that is you teach them principles like you wouldn't take a letter that somebody wrote to you, like Grandma wrote to you a long time ago, and you wouldn't sling one verse out of it. Uh, I'm the number one boy in the whole wide world, because your grandma said that. So you would, you also don't want the kids to take one verse out of context and sling it at somebody either, if it's from a letter. So there's a lesson right in that. Um, then another thing, write this website down, scriptureforall.org. So it's scripture, the number four, the word all.org. And if you go to that website, about halfway down the page, they have links for an online interlinear Bible, Greek or Hebrew. And you don't have to know Greek or Hebrew, but here's the cool thing. You can print a page out of that. Just pick a scripture that's familiar. And what it will list, if you've never seen this, it'll have the Greek or it'll have the Hebrew. And the kids can see what that looks like. And then below it, it'll have a literal English translation. And it's just a jumble. It doesn't just make any sense to them. Have the kids try to translate that English jumble into intelligible sentences, and they'll have fun with it. It's really hard to figure out, even if it's a familiar passage. And then afterwards, you can talk to them about the way the Bible's translated, how you can trust some translations, but you can't trust others. Really valuable lessons that can come from a fun thing. Um, and then the last thing that I want to tell you about that we've done, that the kids really dig, low-budget finger puppet theater. Now, this has gone well, and I think, I don't know if we have a slide for this or not, I'm not sure if we do, but um, what I'll do is, I got I went to Oriental Trading, the source of all things good, and I got these little rubber finger puppets, have you ever seen those, and they're like little Bible puppets, and, and then I'll sit in my office, and I have to be careful who's around, but I'll, I'll print some stuff out and like cut pictures out, and I'll make these goofy dioramas on my couch, and then just take pictures of them with my phone. And it'll be, you know, a Bible story, or it'll be a principle. And uh, so, like, the one that, that I was going to bring, it was from Ecclesiastes, the Court of Three Strands. And so, what I'll do, I'll make up the slides, and then somebody is the dramatic reader. And so we give them the mic in the youth room, throw on heavy reverb as much as possible, and have them either read the passage or read what's going on in the slides. And then, you know, suddenly, just through total nonsense, they can take these stories in, because... Here's the thing, ultimately. The problem with this complete illiteracy, that, um, and it's only a problem, I guess, you know, if we want to look at it that way, is that I find a lot of kids don't even know basic Bible stories anymore, and I don't know if it's the same way for you. I was talking about Samson once, and nobody knew who Samson was, and I was kind of shocked. But then I thought, how beautiful is this, that I'm getting kids who don't already have all that theological baggage that I was talking about from before? Somebody hasn't already explained to them what all this means. We can take them straight to the source, to scripture. And you know, they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And what I'm really talking about is that part where you can lead them to water. So just some silly things that you can try. I've got some more that I would love to talk to you about later if you want. And uh, I think that uh, the key word is familiarity. So what the goal for all these things is, is you're getting the Bible in their hands. If nothing else, they're learning where the index is. If nothing else, they're learning what is available on their phone and how to search for it. So when the time comes that they're looking to God's Word and they want to go to the source, 
they have a means to do it. Sound good? Thank you.